keys to contemplate. Welcome to American Wife History Month South African Series. This is your host, Karen Smith. Our call-in number is 347-637-3768. And our subject today is infighting. Happy Independence Day to our American listeners. This day only came about as a result of a great war in which many perished. Although we are celebrating independence today, it would appear that all over the world we are being divided by race, religion, political persuasion, and any other means that the elite who want to divide and conquer us can think up to divert our attention from the things that really matter. This article by Patrice Lewis from WND sums it up nicely. On this weekend, as we celebrate America's independence, the facts are grim for how dependent we've become. As one example, in the 1970s, one in five, in, one in 50 families received food stamps. Today, it's one in five. That's a tenfold increase. Is America poorer than it was in 1776? Of course not. We're richer, much richer. Then why are so many people dependent on government? Much of it has to do with how much we've permitted government to take over things that are none of its business. Our food, our water, our homes, our transportation, our businesses, our communication, our education, our money, our children, our health care, and just about any other private and individual concern is now mismanaged to a startling degree by the government. Our economy is being ruled, taxed, policied, sawed, and regulated to death. Much of it without input from the citizens. Now answer me this. Was this how the Founding Fathers envisioned America? Of course not. When I look at how far this nation has departed from the ideals of the founders, it makes me want to weep. We're becoming the land of the shackled and the home of the oppressed. Let's face it, dependency is easy. It's the lazy man's way to do things. It's the path of least resistance. But dependency breeds apathy, trashes the work ethic, and corrupts the soul. And make no mistake, these factors, particularly apathy and a lack of work ethic, will take down this nation. We are no longer independent. We are in a war, not declared and not of our making. And the tactics of those that want to rule us completely are working. Meanwhile, the slow war being suffered by the whites in South Africa goes on the back burner. This article from Mike Smith political commentary dated 7th of July last year. The Urban Dictionary defines a slow war as a war that is only visible when the big pattern is revealed over time. If you could play the seemingly isolated events of a slow war in a speeded up time, its real nature would be visible. A slow war is the opposite of the Blitzkrieg. A war so slow that you hardly notice it. A war so slow that those waging it can deny that it's actually happening. Under the fog of war, they hide it as ordinary crime. The end result is still the same as the Blitzkrieg. Total annihilation of the enemy. War has changed a lot after the last hundred years or so. We've seen chemical warfare in World War I, Blitzkrieg in World War II, nuclear war, cold war, people's war, to name but a few. The slow war is also a strategy of the USA against the world, little steps at a time, ever coming closer to the goal of world domination. You see it in their war on drugs in South America, their involvement in Africa under AFRICOM, their military bases strewn all over Europe. The microcosm of this 
is the slow war against whites in South Africa. If the whites were told 20 years ago that they would have to give 50% of their farms away to blacks, you probably would have had a war. If white South Africans were told 20 years ago that their Afrikaans schools and universities would be forced to become English and taken over by blacks, you would have had a war. If you told Afrikaners 20 years ago that their language would disappear from television, you would have had a war. If whites were told that they would be forced out of the civil service in their hundreds of thousands and replaced by incompetent blacks, you would have had war. If you told whites 20 years ago that the names of all their towns and streets would be replaced with the names of Marxist terrorists, you would have had war. If you killed 4,000 white farmers en masse 20 years ago and robbed, raped, tortured and murdered another 40,000 whites in their homes, you would have had a war. If you were told, if you told whites 20 years ago that they would be handing their beautiful country over to incompetent, thieving Marxist scum who would steal their tax money in the billions, you would have had a war. Yet all of this, and a lot more, happened in the 20-year reign of the ANC. Where is the war? The war is one-sided and it is waged by a tyrannical regime against the 10% minority of the population in South Africa who is not fighting back because they cannot see the war. The most amazing part is that so many whites, mostly misanthropic liberals, refuse to acknowledge it. It is only a few right-thinking whites who are able to speed the events of the last 20 years up and see it for what it really is. The ultimate question is, how do you fight against such a slow war? I often get the other type of slow war deniers, those who say that, wait, when the time comes, we'll fight. At the moment, there's no fight yet. Exactly when is that time? These are the ones who do not even realize what kind of war is being waged upon them. They have not made the paradigm shift yet. They are still expecting a Boer War or Border War when the enemy has changed its tactics long ago. Whilst the quicksand slowly sucks them under, they wait for some event where the black hordes will descend upon the whites and murder them in their thousands, an event that might never come. Meanwhile, the slow war continues, and one day they will wake up look out the window and ask, where have all the white South Africans gone? In the last few weeks, I have witnessed an incredible amount of time and energy being expended on fighting each other. Instead of joining together and using that time and energy to fight the real enemy. In the case of South Africa, the enemy is the socialist, communist, ANC. And, in a broader picture, the enemy is the elite who want to rule the world and have us as their minions. Stuart Rhodes of the Oath Keepers in America, in a speech he gave the other day, said, The realities are right in front of your face. This country is running out of time. To all Oath Keepers, Hold an emergency summit in your state immediately. The time is now. Do not wait another second. United we stand. Stuart Rhodes calls on all Oath Keepers to hold the New York Veteran Patriot Emergency Summit in their state. Organize communications, food, medical supplies. Prepare for the worst. Now is the time to set up an emergency food fund in your community. This is very important. And a fellow American show host sent me this statement. If we can't let go of our foolish pride, what individuals think about us, etc., the New World Order is organized, well-funded, and unified. We are disorganized, broke, and cannot unify on a single issue.
The old motto of South Africa was Eendracht Mark Macht. Unity is strength. And we need to take that to heart and live by it. Because there are so few of us, of us whites not only in South Africa, but worldwide. And we must stand together in order to create some sort of future for our children and grandchildren. The infighting amongst all the groups purportedly working for the same ends is endless. And I am shocked and horrified by some of the events of the last 10 days. As a direct result of this fighting each other, a true patriot who has done invaluable work in bringing the misery of the white South Africans to the attention of the British and European Parliament has resigned and stepped back from the fight. Here is her message. I decided this past week not to rise to the attack, but today I wanted closure as I won't allow this ridiculous, unproductive toxicity in my life which ultimately affects my people and their struggle for safety and peace. My loyalty to white South Africa is undeniable. My work speaks for itself. It is all documented. I have sacrificed much to the cause because I believed in my people. But this past work week has shown me that everything I valued and did for them was irrelevant to them. So now, I pray that others can continue the struggle to help white South Africans find safety. I have come to the end of this dreadful road. I began this journey over nine years ago. It has consumed my life. I am now unemployable due to the vicious lies online about me. My family suffers through these lies. I would prefer to live my days out rating for my people, hoping the others realize the damage they cause by infighting and cease such childish behavior. I wish everyone well. May God bless each and every person trying to help the white South Africans. And God bless our brothers and sisters living in daily fear of the real enemy, the ANC. Take care. Claudia Bryant. Instead of doing this, is, is, is this following article not what we should be concentrating on? A report that appeared in a Washington, USA publication about the murder of a white girl in South Africa. Minky Orkham, 16, a matric pupil from Springs on the East Grand, died after an armed black murderer shot her in the face in cold blood while on her way to friends to study for her exams. Minky Okam was hit in the mouth by the bullet which came out behind her neck. Last night, the school books were still lying on the dining room table where she left them before starting the car, a small Hyundai Aetos. Her father, Willie Okam, who is in a state of shock, stayed from their home in Langsburg Street in East Wells Springs. She was so young, they could have just taken the car. She was such a free spirit and always sang. Oakham said while pointing to a guitar standing in the dining room. She was their only child and a, at a, and a pupil at Dr. Johann Gergens High School in Springs. She planned to study technical drawing or event management next year as she finally decided what she wanted to do. Her mother, Carol, said they waited 10 years for Minky and now their only child is dead. Ali, who was also at their home at the time, said she heard her name with a scream. Then she heard two shots. Even in America, people are killing each other for one reason or another. But in South Africa, white people are being killed because of the color of their skin. South African whites, which includes the Boer people of South Africa, have been placed on the World Genocide Watch. The problem is the world's liberal, liberal press are not interested in spotlighting the horrific murders taking place right here in South Africa. The last picture taken was her mother, Carol. Minky was shot and killed for no reason. This 
was just one of dozens of genocide murders and attacks over the past month. This one has been highlighted because the poor girl was so young and could not harm anyone, yet was killed for no reason other than ethnic cleansing. Usually about 80% of these genocide murders are committed on the farms on older people who are also incapable of defending themselves. And another article, these people are the things that we should be concentrating on rather than fighting each other in all the groups that are purportedly fighting to help white South Africans. This article from Withy News, South Africa now a slaughterhouse for white people. Please pray for all of us. I want to ask you to take one minute of your time right now where you are to close your eyes and pray. Please pray for us in South Africa. Pray that God will shorten this time for us and that it will all be over soon. Since last week, there have been a wave of murders on white South Africans. Why would we expect anything less? For the black people have threatened for a while now that they would do exactly what they are doing now. This beautiful country that once had dreams of being a rainbow nation has all crashed into a heap of lies, murders, and corruption. The worst of all is that the white people in South Africa have to pay the price at any cost. The price is steep. It costs them their lives, their families' lives, and their children. This situation is all becoming unbearable for us. Please, we need prayers. We need people that can start to take a stand for what is going on in this new so-called democratic South Africa. The true story is not getting out there. Please help us spread the word. Never stop praying. This is what is happening in South Africa right now. Alyssa Werther, 13, her father, Anton, 51, and older sister, Megan, 17, were ambushed outside their home in Mildestrup, Johannesburg. And another one, a teacher, 41, killed in her home the day after her 41st birthday. Her throat was split. And a 68-year-old man killed with his own shovel inside their own home. A woman shot dead for her handbag. Dillian Henning, 51, was shot dead the past week in front of their business in Boxburg, Johannesburg. Why would we be surprised in any way? The killings of our white people have been motivated since 1994. They're even worse now with people like Julius Fulema. A fan page dedicated to the previous ANCYO leader does not make any secret of the black people's intent to kill white South Africans. One of the comments on that page was, You effing white pigs, Malema is our leader. He will kill Zuma within the next six weeks. They also talk about taking back of the stolen land and murder of whites in South Africa. 3,000 farmers dead since 94. We lost more than that. We are far from being even. So killed a boer, killed a farmer, one of his fans wrote. The ANC government of South Africa is not interested in protecting white people. This country has become a slaughterhouse where white people's blood is coloring the ground red. The blood of innocent white South Africans are on the hands of the government. Now, is that not where our attention should be focused? Are things like that not what we should be fighting? Instead of fighting each other. Ted Cruz put out a statement today. If you are like me and pay attention to the news every day, you can easily be overwhelmed by all the simultaneous events that seem to indicate an impending American decline. But I don't believe that. Everywhere I go, I see it, I see it in their faces and hear it in their voices. Americans want to believe again. 
On this July the 4th, I want to share with you my hope for America. In the summer of 1776, patriots gathered to dissolve all the political bonds they had with England and declare their independence. The bold call for independence presupposed that the colonists were equal in station to the British Empire. They listed their grievances as justification for the split. The 56 signers from the 13 colonies affixed their signatures to the document. It could only mean one thing, war. Indeed, the American Resolution came. Today, we live out the Founders' promise to America that a free people pursuing their dreams would lead to limitless possibilities. My father came to America from Cuba in 1957. He had very little money and spoke little English. My Irish-Italian mother was the daughter of working-class parents. Both my parents worked hard and were the first to graduate from college. In a single generation, their son became a United States Senator, and now I'm running for the President of the United States. That could only happen in America. What I understand is that story is not unique. Most Americans have a similar story in their family history. These stories demonstrate how America is truly the land of limitless opportunity. The 4th of July always reminds me of the opportunity America gave my family. And I ask myself, what have I done today to ensure that same opportunity exists for future generations? We're an exceptional nation and it is up to each of us to keep it that way. Happy Fourth. That is from Ted Cruz. But in another article from the Free Thought Project, Project, they state 10 reasons why you have no reason to celebrate freedom this Fourth of July. As Americans don their red, white, and blue sequence barbecue aprons and raise their flags, ironically made in China, in an effort to celebrate their freedom. We should be asking ourselves, what freedoms do Americans really have? We are under constant surveillance, our every move under a microscope by government goons, protecting us from terrorists. We are under the constant threat of violence from the state, for possessing a plant or having a taillight out, or simply walking down the street. Americans are constantly paranoid of those blue and red lights popping up in the rearview mirror that almost always end in extortion and could very well end with a visit to the hospital, being locked in a cage, or worse. In the land of the free, police killed more people in just one month of this year than the United Kingdom has in the entire 20th century. In the land of the free, we are told to fear the terrorists, but U.S. police killed 58 times more people than all terrorist activity against U.S. civilians since 9-11. Sadly, when people do begin to question this paradigm of violence against the citizens and the usurping of freedom, blame is quickly associated and directed toward whatever corporate puppet is in charge. Then, they just go back to sleep, resolute in the notion that they can vote those bastards out and it will all be fixed. Rubus Americanus then slips back into Lola Land, cheering on the police state as if they're fans on a football stadium, sidelines. But your team is not winning. Just for a moment, can we stop chanting that USA is number one? Can we remove the patriotic blinders for a moment and take a look at the categories in which we are actually number one, because it's certainly not freedom. According to the 2014 Legatum Prosperity Index released in November, in the measure of personal freedom, the United States has fallen from ninth place in 2010 to 21st place worldwide. Behind such countries as Canada, the UK, Germany, Uruguay, and Costa Rica. Other such ranking systems show the U.S. as low as 46. Yet somehow, Americans still believe their leaders when they say that terrorists hate our freedom, as if the terrorists 
took down the first 45 freest countries and are just now getting to us. No, we are most assuredly not number one in freedom. But we are, however, number one in prison population, obesity, child abuse death rate, hours spent in front of the television, teen pregnancy rate, prescription drug use, citizens killed by police, debt, crime, arbitrary, immoral, and downright evil laws. How ironic is it that the land of the free has the most laws on the entire planet? Attorney Harvey Silverplate argues that the average American commits three felonies a day without even knowing it. Although it has been estimated that there are over 3,000 types of federal criminal offenses, no one knows the exact number for sure. At any given time, a police officer could walk up to you and find you in violation of some arbitrary law. It's a mathematical certainty. So next time your chest begins to fill up with patriotic puffs, stop for a second and realize that Americans are number one, but not in a good way. In the meantime, however, we still have the freedom in this country to inform ourselves and others Only through a lesser ignorance will these horrid, tyrannical traits subside. Humanity is involved in a struggle, as we have always been, but there are much more of us now. Inciting peaceful change has never been more important. However, so many well-meaning individuals go about inciting this change with blunt force. This has to change. If you truly want to make the world a more peaceful place, you have to become a more peaceful person. Petty infighting, personal attacks, vitriol and hate are the tools of tyrants and also of those who only claim to be awake. Peace is true professionalism. Next time you're cringing in a public setting, listening to Joe Sixpack spout of at NFL stats like an ESFPN commentator, wait for an opportune time and plant a seed. Hey, Joe, speaking of Kansas City Chiefs, what do you think of the wide receiver Dwayne Bauer and his arrest for having weed? Do you think it's cool that he was deprived of his freedom for having a plant? How can we legitimately call this country the land of the free when that can happen to someone? Be the change that you want to see in this world. Now, people, this has been a terrible time for me. I have not understood half of the things that have been going on amongst the South African and American and absolutely worldwide groups. We are all, all fighting for freedom. We are all fighting for for the rights that are ours, God-given rights, people, not rights given to us by governments or by an elite that do not have our best interests at heart. And yet, we cannot agree on anything. It is the most horribly sad thing for me to see that my friends, my friends who have done incredible work for humanity, for mankind, for South African whites, are now fighting each other over petty differences. Why can we not take the time and the energy that that fight takes and fight the genuine enemy? In the case of South Africa, the ANC regime, Malema and the EFF, who have this week declared that they are willing to start a civil war to get their own way. Why are we not standing together and fighting the common enemy? The black tribes in South Africa, however many of them there are, 11 or 17, have got this down to a fine art because we 
the wife of the common enemy. We are to blame for everything from the day that the first white man set his foot on African shores. The whites are to blame. They have a united cause. They stand up together, all these disparate tribes that would be fighting each other did they not have us as their common enemy. And we cannot agree on one single thing. And yet they outnumber us in South Africa at least 10 to 1. What is wrong with us? that we cannot join hands, form a combined strong force with a strong voice and fight the real enemy. We are not enemies of each other. We may have different ideas on how things should be done. We always will disagree on those things. But can we not discuss that privately amongst ourselves instead of hanging our dirty washing out to dry in public, fighting each other publicly while the whole world looks on and laughs at us? How do we, white South Africans, expect to gain the sympathy of the outside world for our just cause? By fighting each other, by using horrible language and horrible slurs against our own people publicly for the whole world to see. Why then do we expect them to sympathize with us and take up our cause when they have problems of their own and fight with us when we can't fight with each other against the common enemy. The ANC and the ESS is the enemy, people. We, whites, are not the enemy. Why is it so impossible for us to put our egos in our pockets and join to and fight the real battle. As an example of this, you all know that I'm stationed in Texas. I got a frantic call from somebody in South Africa late yesterday saying that there were 27 white people, including a lot of children, starving and freezing to death in a place near Pretoria. Could I help? By this morning, those people had received food, clothes, and promises of future aid. Because why? Because I work together. I network with people in South Africa. I offer a hand of friendship to any white person who is willing to stand up from behind their PC and actually go out there and do something constructive to help with the problem in South Africa. Now, why is it that we are not spending the hours and hours and hours and mega units of energy helping the cause instead of damaging it, because that is what we are doing with our public infighting and backstabbing. We are damaging the cause, not only in South Africa, but on an international stage, and it has to stop, or we will never get the help and sympathy that is required for us to actually get aid to the people that need it. I seldom, seldom go on a rant. I invite important guests on this show and let them have their say because every side of the story needs to be heard. 
and everybody should have their ideas and their thoughts heard so that we can take the best of them and use them for the people of South Africa. But recently, I have felt that I am wasting my time, my energy, my money, and what is left of my life on a cause that we are losing for ourselves. Nobody is losing it for us except us. We are damaging ourselves so badly in the international arena that I am beginning to think that our problems will never be solved because we cannot put more than two of us together in one place without the knives coming out and being put into somebody's back. It is time for us to forget our petty differences, forget that you're a Boer and you're an Afrikaner and I'm English, and so we all hate each other. We are less than 10% of the population, and we need to have any chance to win. We need to join hands, stand together, and fight for one cause against one enemy, the ANC regime. It is not your brother across the road that you are fighting with now that is killing your families. It is not a white person that is breaking into your house, torturing, raping, and walking out without stealing anything. It is not a white person doing farm invasions, killing off our farmers, and thus reducing us to starvation. It is not white people who are the enemy. And it is not also, it is also not every black person who is the enemy. It is the elites who are singing, kill the Boer, in Parliament, and bring me my machine gun, in Parliament. Those are the enemy. Those are the people we should be uniting to fight against. And there is nothing to say. We cannot take the hand of a black person like Menzies, who most of you South Africans know, who is an incredibly educated, well-spoken black man who is fighting our cause. Why can we not take hands with somebody like him and the many other black people in South Africa like him who are suffering the same fate that we are? They would willingly join forces with us and fight the ANC government. But we are too ego-driven and too, I almost said neo-Nazi, but too filled with hatred hatred of anybody who is not exactly the same as us, to be able to do a thing like that, that would benefit our cause and maybe, just maybe, bring down the enemy. This is not a I can pee further than you can contest. This is a please help us help each other. That is what I thought this was all about. But apparently, I am wrong. This fight is apparently two other people, a fight about who's got a bigger ego, who can get more airtime, who can get more fame and fortune. And speaking of that, recently I have found two groups of people that are raising funds on the backs of the white South African misery, torture and murder raising funds, and not one penny of it is going to a needy South African. It is going into the pockets of people who are riding on your backs to get rich. Now, why are we not using our time behind a keyboard to research these people and naming and shaming them and not letting them exist and not letting them thrive of the misery of our brothers and sisters in South Africa. Would that not be a better use of our time and our energy? But no, it would appear that those of us who want to work together, who do the research, who spend their time and energy on good works, are to be stabbed in the back by some other white person supposedly fighting for the same cause, who disagrees with something we have either said or done. 
we need to realize that not one of us is perfect. It says in the Bible that let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, to those of you who have been throwing rock, I would say to you, look at yourself and see whether you are so spotlessly white and clean and sin-free that you can afford to throw rocks and hurtful comments and make people resign from positions where they are helping. Are you so pure that you can do this? Are you so sure that there is nothing there to be thrown back at you? Think about it, people. None of us, not one single one of us, is perfect. And yet, we cannot, we cannot bring it about that we will stand together, hold hands with our neighbor, though we may disagree with some of his policies. Hold hands and fight a battle against the elite. Because this battle, my South African brothers and sisters, is not just a South African one. This battle is worldwide. The black Africans who have escaped colonialism are now flocking out of their own countries under their own rule because they have destroyed everything and are starving, have no work, and have no future. And they are flocking to Europe, to anywhere, any single white country that they can possibly get to. They are flocking there in their hundreds of thousands. And what are they going to do once they get there? They are going to turn that country into the same hellhole that they just escaped from. And where then is a place for us? Nowhere, nowhere on earth at this moment is safe for white people because the black hordes of Africa are fleeing what they have created and trying to destroy what little remains of civilization. And if we cannot, cannot, and will not stand up and fight this, we are finished. Because those same hordes of poor, dispossessed people are outbreeding us ten to one, and we are becoming an absolute minority in our own countries. The statistics in Europe and in America and anywhere where these blacks are being taken in as refugees, the statistics of rape, murders, and criminal offenses are enormous. And it is not white on white. It is black on white. And we are facilitating the fact that they can take over every European country because we feel white guilt, which in itself is rubbish. But we have been convinced that we are guilty of some horrific crime because we are proud of our white race and we are proud of what we have created. And now we have to bow down and allow these people who have destroyed Africa, an enormous continent, they've destroyed it and are fleeing so they can destroy more of what we have built. We are going to be decimated and gone from this earth if we do not join hands worldwide and fight for our race. Forget about white guilt. Forget about the worn out use of the word racist. And remember what we as a white race have done worldwide. It is being destroyed. And I have said since the day I started on this mission of bringing the white genocide in South Africa to the attention of the world, I have said that South Africa is a microcosm of the rest of the world. And the world needs to pay attention to what is happening there because it is coming to their doorstep. Well, no one wanted to hear that. And it is now 
not only on their doorstep, it's in their homes, it's in their streets. Things like Ferguson, burning and destruction of an entire town to the tune of, I think, $39 million, is a typical South African situation. Does that not happen every single day in South Africa? A riot, a protest, burning, destruction, schools burned, hospitals burned, hospitals taken apart piece by piece by our black brothers. People didn't want to see that what is happening in the so-called Rainbow Nation is coming to their doorstep. And now it's there. And if we do not turn back the tide of people who know nothing but rape, pillage, ru ruin and burn and destroy, if we do not turn that tide back to their own countries, which they have already destroyed, what do we think is the future of our country? The future of Europe, the future of the USA, the future of Australia, the future of New Zealand, any single white country is being overrun right now by savages who cannot any longer live in the countries that they themselves created. Now, I am not saying that there are not good black people, good, industrious, hardworking. I have just said we should join hands with them because they are suffering the same fate as the whites are. The murder rates in South Africa are enormous. And it is not just black on white. It is black on black as well. And we need to look diligently, search out and find those people who have the same interests at heart that we have, that have the interests of freedom and civilization and the, 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 the upgrading of our civilization, that, that have humanity, the best will towards humanity as their basis of thought. We need to join hands with them, no matter what color, what religion, what creed, what language. We need to stand together and leave a better world for our children and our grandchildren. This infighting that we are indulging in all across the world, all across every patriot group, all across all the people that are fighting for the better of humanity, it is happening everywhere, and humanity is becoming just a word that none of us believe in. We need to seek out right-thinking people who agree in principle with what we are fighting for. They do not need to agree with every single thing that we think. We just need to stand up and fight the common enemy. So... You will see on the promo for this show a call out and a plea to raise funds to get one South African family out of South Africa. My plan is that we get them out one family at a time. But unfortunately, although I have been begging and pleading for at least a month to help these people, we have only raised half the funds required. Please, people, if you are within reach of my voice, please put your money where your mouth is. We are helping fellow human beings. And if we can get it right with this one family, we can then broaden our scope and help some others. On a more selfish note, those of you who know me know that my health is failing. You know that I need an incredibly urgent spinal operation, or I will end up as a quadriplegic. Although I don't like to talk about myself, and I do not want the sympathy vote, I want you to understand that these, this family who is coming from South Africa will be helping me. They will take over this particular show, 
and help me with all the other work that I do. I need the help, and if the voice of South Africans is to reach America, my voice or the voice of this show and another show that I am involved in cannot, cannot be silent. So please think hard. Ten dollars will not put you into poverty or below poverty level, but it will make an enormous difference in getting these people here. They have their visas. They are ready to leave. We need to be helping them. On that note, please heed my words today and help us to help each other by working together. God bless America, God bless South Africa, and God help the world that we live in today. And as always, I am playing out with my personal gesture of defiance, de stem. Mm-hmm.